Uh, so 23 represents Psalm 23. And uh, if you're a guest of ours today, or maybe the first time you're tuning in online, or you just forget where you were the last four weeks, let me catch you up real quickly, okay? <laughs> Uh, when David, best thinking is, when he was about 65, maybe late 60s, uh, he sits down to write uh, a, a psalm or a sacred hymn, if you will. And I don't know that he knew at that time, I don't think so, that it would become the most famous of all of his writings, but it is. And uh, many of us have memorized it, and it means a great deal to us. And uh, yet I don't know when he sat in his palace bedroom or wherever he wrote this by candlelight, that as he wrote it, he was doing anything other than reflecting on his life and just thinking of what life was like with his, his God. And for some reason, what triggers for him, probably because of his experience as a young man and then through his teen years and into his 20s, he thinks about when he was a shepherd of a group of sheep and what that meant for him and how, how he took responsibility for that and how he saw himself as the shepherd to those sheep. And so I just imagine him sitting there, end of the day, and going, God, you've, you've, you've been like a shepherd to me, like I was a shepherd to my sheep. And when I think about me being a shepherd, this is the stuff that I think about. I think about the fact that, Lord, you're my shepherd. Verse one, if we can put that slide up. There we go. The Lord is my shepherd. All of us have a shepherd, every single one of us. Uh, now, it may not be a person, it may be a job, it may be a vision, a mission, a purpose, whatever it would be, but we're all led by something or somebody, and David says, I discovered the great God of the universe is my shepherd, and because of that, he provides me everything that I need. I don't go through life with this, I need this kind of approach to life. I do have needs, and I do have wants, but I, I've discovered he's so good that I rest in him, and my life isn't made up of wants. It's made up of satisfaction. In fact, he makes me lie down in green pastures, and we learned that's not rolling hills of green, lush grass. That's uh, sprouts of grass that show up in the morning, and the shepherd has to know where they are, and the shepherd has to lead the sheep to that because the provision for that day depends on that sprout of grass or two along the way, and we're just made to be dependent. And David discovered, I'm dependent on God. I am. He says he makes me lie down. He leads me to the quiet waters, quiet waters of rest and unhurry living. Sheep were not just thirsty and the shepherd would provide water for them, but he provided rest. Rest where they could relax, rest where they could take the weight of the world off their shoulders. And this is what David discovers about his shepherding and God's shepherding of his life. And then he says this, he says, he restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. From the beginning of the series, we've decided we were going to try to do this. We're going to try to put ourselves back into the time frame 3,000 years ago when David wrote this in the place where he wrote it so we could get a sense of the context of which he writes this in. If we get the context wrong and we just kind of contemporize it for us, we may well add a definition to the psalm that David never intended. And so we've been trying to put ourselves back in the Negev desert as a shepherd and thinking through the eyes of David of what he was writing. So this appears to be something about paths of righteousness. And maybe, just maybe, as David is sitting in his bedroom in his palace that evening, this is what he thinks about when he thinks about paths of righteousness. So we're doing all this talk about sheep and shepherds, but... Where are all the sheep? <laughs> Even just a few verses from this well-known psalm, we can see that if we read it with a Western perspective, we miss some of the depth and some of the details. These verses from Psalm 23 remind us that our dependency is to be on God, not our career, not our retirement, not our relationship status, not the number of likes we get on Instagram. If the Lord really is our shepherd, then we need to rely on Him for every minute of every hour of every day. And when we do that, He will lead us onto the right path. 
The Hebrew word for paths used in Psalm 23 is the same as the word used to describe someone walking around in circles. Now, when a shepherd needs to get their sheep down from a hill in the desert, they can't just let the sheep run straight down or they'll get injured because the hill is so steep. So instead, they lead the sheep around the mountain in circles. Over the years, the sheep have worn these paths into the side of most hills. This is what the Bible is referring to when it speaks of paths of righteousness. This is how the shepherd of Psalm 23 gets the sheep safely down the mountain. So many times when we think of paths of righteousness, we think of an obvious path that we would know to stay on. And yet, don't our lives often feel more like this? Lots of different paths, lots of different options and choices. It can be difficult to know what way is the right way to go. And maybe today you're wondering the same thing. What's the right step for your life? And that's exactly why we need a shepherd to lead us on the right path. It's uh, so interesting to me, a couple of years ago when I went to Israel, traveling from the Dead Sea up to Jericho and then up to Jerusalem, uh, you're driving right through the Negev Desert where David was. And you literally see these hills, just like we're going to show in this picture right here, that are, have these, these trails and these paths all the way along them. And you kind of go, can we put that up, please? There we go. You, you see these trails and you go, well, that must be some kind of natural erosion. And then you discover, no, like thousands of years, three, four, five thousand years, those have been carved into the sides of the hills by sheep in single file and in groups walking across and around those hills. It's really stunning. So what is then the connection between those trails that David may well have had in mind and righteousness? Why are those trails righteous? Or what's David thinking? Well, let me start here. What do you think of when you think of righteous? Or righteousness, the term, the word. If you were uh, around in the 30s or so and you were a jazz fan, this uh, word became popular because if there was a really good jazz riff, it was a righteous riff. It was, apparently. It wasn't there, but apparently. Then in the 40s, if you were kind of a, like a, an early hipster and you dressed in some kind of cool, fashionable way, that was referred to as righteous fashion or righteous look. And then the word was dormant for 40 years, and some surfer kids from California came up with it, had some cool waves, and said, righteous dude, that's a righteous dude way, right? That's, the word. that's not what I think of. I was raised in a really conservative church environment, and I only ever thought of the word as a religious word. It was the list of do's and don'ts. And if you do the do's and don't do the don'ts, you're righteous. It was about a set of behaviors, some kind of moral code, some kind of like religious list of things that you better adhere to and you better do like, like the don'ts, like don't curse, don't smoke, don't drink, don't go to movies, like all the don'ts, right? But there were do's, do go to church every, do read your Bible, do pray, oh, do honor your parents, right? And so this word for me becomes this list of things that I need to do and things I don't need to do. And I have a question. Is that what David thought about when he thought about paths of righteousness? Did he think about, as a shepherd, I've got to get my sheep to do the do's and don't do the don'ts, and when they do, they're going to be on these trails around the mountain. Somehow it doesn't make sense. So what's he after? What does this word mean? Well, here's what we need to do with this text. It looks like there are three ideas in it. It looks like uh, he, he leads me, uh, he restores my soul. Second, he leads me in paths of righteousness. And thirdly, he does this for his name's sake. And if we're not careful, we can draw three separate ideas out of that, but that's one sentence for David. In the original Hebrew, those all go together. There's one linear thought that he has here. There are three ideas within it, but they all link together. So, for example, he restores my soul. I don't know what you think of when restore. You might think of your COVID-19 bath renovation project that you did, <laughs> right? You restored an old bathroom. Or you might think of your 1950s era green Buick that's constantly being restored. You're pouring more money into it and it just never gets there, right? It's a restoration 
not what it means. The same root word, but this particular part of restoration is this. It's the idea of getting back on the path. It's the idea of being restored to the right path that you should be on, the good way to live. Now, David is, I think, thinking this. I think he thinks it's possible for his sheep to get off the path. And if they get off the path, that's the best path because that's where some of the grazing happens. It's the best path because if you get off the path, it could be dangerous and it's a straight shot down the ravine to the bottom. That could be deadly. So he looked at his sheep, I think, and he said, you know, occasionally my sheep get off the path and I restore them to the path because I'm a good shepherd. It could also be that sometimes a sheep would be on the right path, but the grass is even more sparse than it usually is, and the surroundings looks a little disorienting, and it's a little dangerous, and I can't see the shepherd, and the sheep might think, oh, I'm off the path. This shouldn't be this hard. It shouldn't be this dangerous. But the sheep's on the path. It's just, it's hard, and it's challenging, and it's difficult, and inside the sheep, mind of the sheep, they're going, oh, I'm, I must be off the path. i got to get back on the path. And in that case, the shepherd comes to the sheep and goes, no, you're on the path. This isn't easy being a sheep. There are challenges to being a sheep. There are dangers to being a sheep, but I'm here. You're on the path. Keep going. Now, do you ever get off the path? Sure, the answer is yes. We all do. And we need a shepherd to not just scold us, to not just say you're doing it wrong, but to lovingly restore us to the path that he would have for us. Here's what's more often for me face a difficult situation, a challenge, a trial, tough, a tough diagnosis, dead-end job, conflict in my home, conflict in culture, disappointment with things, just stuff that happens. That goes on long enough, I start to wonder whether I'm on the path. It shouldn't be this hard. I'm a follower of you, Jesus. You're the good shepherd, but this doesn't look like you're leading me someplace. It looks like I've gotten off the path. Have I gotten off the Is this happening because you're upset with me? Is this going on because you're trying to correct me? Been there too, right? The good shepherd, David would say, just like I was with my sheep, comes to the sheep and either reminds them, you're on the path, I know it's hard, but I'm with you, or you're off the path, I'm going to help you. And those paths that I'm going to put you on, they're paths of righteousness. That, in David's mind, was different than good behavior. He doesn't, as a shepherd, go to his sheep and go, okay, let's get you back on the path. Now behave properly. It's about behavior. Uh Uh-uh. It's about a destination. See, David is not interested, I don't think, in growing like a group of sheep that are well-behaved. I think he's trying to grow sheep that are thriving in life, that are doing well in life that are walking with the shepherd, walking with him, trusting him, in spite of those trails not being a straight line from here to success or here to good health or here to a great marriage. They're sometimes circuitous. They look like they're going around the mountain. You're going around and around and around. Where is this leading? But the good shepherd would say, those are paths of righteousness. Because this is not about correcting or changing your behavior. It's changing you into someone who walks with the shepherd and thrives and makes decisions based on the will of the shepherd. Makes choices in life because you know the shepherd, because the shepherd's part of your world and your life. He's never away from you. You're walking those circuitous, crazy paths of righteousness because it isn't about what you do, it's who you become. And I want you not just to be a well-behaved sheep or follower. I want to do every moment of life with you so that I get you back on the track, get you back on the path, or encourage you along the path, and I'm forming you into someone who intuitively and naturally, in the moment, over time, makes choices and decisions that come from the inside of you because you've been formed into someone who consistently thinks like the shepherd. That's what David was after. And then what, what's within like his namesake? What's that? Well, every one of the sheep had some kind of a marking 
on the sheep, either some natural dyes that would mark the sheep in red or green or yellow, whatever it would be, or the shepherd would notice some unique physical attribute of that sheep, and then the shepherd would give the sheep a name, and he would have a unique whistle or a unique call for that sheep to come and follow. So the shepherd was intimately connected with each one of the sheep and approached the sheep as individuals that the shepherd owned and cared for and loved and nourished. And if that sheep somehow failed, either by neglect of the shepherd or just stuff happened, it was the reputation of the shepherd that was on the line. And this shepherd was a good shepherd. And this shepherd wanted his sheep to thrive in the deepest places of their souls. And if they didn't, the shepherd felt he was on the line for that. Do you know that the righteousness that is meant to be part of your life is not something you can work for? It's something given to you. It's something implanted in you. But you and I can cooperate with it and watch that righteousness grow, or we can be distracted with this notion that righteousness is about behavior. And I have to do a certain thing, and there's a certain religious rule I have to follow. And then we miss out on the internal growth that God wants to bring to your and my life. That's the motive center he wants to work on. I think David understood this. I wondered as he was sitting, wherever he wrote this, it's just Brad's imagination, he's sitting in his palace bedroom writing this at night, but if that's what he was doing, I wonder as he wrote each one of these lines whether he didn't think back on his life and, oh, I had an experience like that, and that experience taught me this, and so it's not just how I was as a shepherd, but this is how the shepherd has interacted with me. And I'm wondering if he didn't think in this case of 1 Samuel chapter 26, A little bit of background to the story. David is now, at this stage of his journey, he's hiding out in the Negev Desert, in the southern part of the Negev Desert, down close to the Dead Sea. It's barren landscape. He's there with four or 500 ragtag soldiers that misfits from culture that have found David, and he's trying to coalesce them into a fighting machine, and well, it doesn't always go well for him. And he's, he's running, he's fleeing from the king, from King Saul. Uh, Saul has risen to power. He's Israel's first king. And uh, somehow or other, David has crossed ways with Saul. Saul hates David. Saul pursues David with 3,000 elite troops. He's going to kill David. He's going to wipe him out because he feels threatened by David. That's not how it started out. It started out with David taking the life of Israel's nemesis, the Philistines, Goliath, the giant. Uh, David takes him out, and he's uh, elevated, promoted to a place in Saul's cabinet and uh, given some military responsibilities, and David is really successful with that. And uh, he kind of wins the heart of the country, and well, that makes Saul jealous. And like leaders before Saul and leaders after Saul, if, you, if your power is threatened, if your influence is threatened, you, you protect your power and you protect your influence. And this is what Saul does. And so he tries to take David out a number of different ways. It's just a really amazing story. It must have been challenging for David. Have you ever been pursued by someone? Like, not because they love you, but because they want to hurt you? They want to take you out? Anybody here on someone's, like, assassination list? it's tough for David, right? So he flees and Saul relentlessly pursues them and now they're in the southern desert and David's scouts have told him that Saul and his troops are coming and David expects them. Sure enough, Saul and his troops show up. They camp in a valley. David's overlooking it with his ragtag group of guys and David has an idea. He turns to Abishai, his military associate, and he says, what if, what if we go down and we invade Saul's camp, and I don't know what we're going to do when we get there, but we're going to go. And they do go, and they sneak up to Saul, and there beside Saul is his spear. And Abishai takes it, and you know what's going to happen, right? He's going to take Saul. What an opportunity. David had been anointed as king already. Saul had lost favor with God. This would be the perfect solution, 
perfect solution. Well, this is what David says. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. And then there's something that goes off in David that's deeply rooted in him and his righteousness inside. He has this idea, but whoa, 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 whoa. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. God's got this. God's going to take care of it. Either his time will come and he'll die of kind of natural causes or he's going to go into battle and perish. It's not up to me. Next verse. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. And that's what they do. They take it. They go up to a mountaintop overlooking it. And then David shouts down to the camp, kind of ridiculing Saul's guys for letting David infiltrate the camp. And uh, this is what happens. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? And David replied, Yep, it's me, my lord, the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? And what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my lord, the king, listen to his servant's words. Pause for just a second. I wonder if it isn't at this point where David looks at his situation and he goes, I wonder whether I'm still on the path with God. I wonder with Saul coming out to get me whether this is somehow God, I don't know. Maybe he's cursing me. Maybe I somehow messed up some things and I'm off the path. Or maybe, maybe it's just Saul and who he is and his personality, that he's just jealous. Maybe that's what it is. You can see some confusion in him. He says, if the Lord has incited you, no, let's go back, yeah. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If however men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They've now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, go serve other gods. Now the next verse. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. It's like David is in this place wondering, God, am I on the path? Am I, are you here with me? Is this just like, like your curse for me? Is like, what's going on? You can see the conflict. And then in a moment of clarity, it's like he realizes, no, 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 no. That's not what righteousness is. Righteousness isn't whether God's happy or sad with me. God, righteousness isn't whether I behave properly or not. Righteousness is something that's inside. It's a decision place. It's a motivation place. It's why I do the things that I do. For he says, look, I know this. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. He doesn't say rewards every man for his deeds, his do's and don'ts. He gets the list just right. No, he says, the Lord delivered me into your hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Is there a, yep. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. It's like David looks back over his life in that incident and he says, I was in that place where I wasn't sure I was on the path or not. And then... I realized that the paths weren't about behavior. It was about God in me. It was about God forming my nature and my character. And then when I had the decision to, I had an opportunity to make a decision I would regret where I would take over what you wanted, God, you stopped me. Because righteousness isn't out external. It's internal. It's what you do here. And you did it because you love me. You, you help with righteousness because you value life, just like I va- valued Saul's life. You value my life. This is the nature of what righteousness is. Do you know Jesus had something to say about this too? It was a big part of the theme of his world and his life. There's a story in Matthew where he gathers early on in his ministry, he gathers thousands of people on a hillside in front of him, and he teaches them something. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount. Here's a part of that sermon in Matthew. He says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, hold on. That's what that crowd knew as righteousness. They they knew their, their Pharisees and teachers of the law, which were the religious elite. They were the teachers and the instructors and the pastors and the, the, the people that held the law close to them. They looked to them and said, those are the really righteous people. But you know what those righteous people taught? A list of behaviors. Listed the Ten Commandments and then listed some others. And if they didn't have one that covered bad behavior, they made one up. Because it was all about righteousness by behavior. 
righteousness by following a set of external actions. And Jesus comes along and says, your righteousness has to be more than that or you can't actually live in the kingdom with God. That's not about going to heaven when you die. That's about living here and now in the presence where God is king and we take our little king or kingdom or queendom and we move it under his kingdom and queendom and he, he ha- his kingdom and he has control over it. That's what he's, you can't live there if you're gonna try to get there and stay there by following some set of behaviors. Jesus comes along and he says, everything changes now because I'm in the world and I am gonna I'm going to shatter that notion that you're righteous by your behavior. I am going to do something where I am going to become your righteousness. I'm going to take care of all of those deficiencies that your behavior can never, ever achieve. It always falls short, and it's a terrible way to live. It's a burdensome way to live. And I am going to make you right. And once you're right, the behavior is secondary. Now, hold on. Does that mean that when we say yes to Jesus and we say yes to his righteousness, which by the way comes by virtue of his death on a cross and his resurrection and the infilling of God's spirit when we say yes, does that now mean that it's licensed to do whatever we want and it doesn't matter? No. A thousand times no. However, Jesus is willing to take that risk that that's how we might interpret it. But here's what he's banking on. If you really let me be your shepherd, if you really do give in to my leadership, if you get to know me as the good shepherd who takes you to places where you can be fully dependent on me and takes you to a place of unhurried rhythms of life where you do every moment with me, I am so convinced that it's gonna reshape who you are from the inside out. It's gonna reshape your thinking that those old patterns of behavior are just going to become unattractive and uninteresting to you and you're going to have a whole new way to live life. That's the risk he takes with you and me every day. That our righteousness comes as a gift of his grace inside of us. It's a stunning way to live. Do you know that I lived the majority of my adult life not knowing that? I mean, I knew it. And yet my moment-by-moment default was to check my behavior. Am I in line? Am I doing the do's and not doing the don'ts? And it's just burdensome. And then you realize at some point, by God's grace, I did, that no, my behavior might well have sent him to a cross. But when he came back to life and he put his spirit in me, I was made right by him. I'm right. I'm okay. I still do behaviors that are not what I want but I'm declared right because of what he's done. And he is shaping and molding the motive center of my life. I learned this as a little boy. I don't know who told me this, but it's helped me a lot. Somebody else said it, I'm sure. I am not this smart. But here's what I was told. If you do the right thing for the wrong reason, you will eventually do the wrong thing because it's about the right reason. And this is what Jesus comes to do, to change the reason, to bring life to that so that you and I will live out of that. And now how we do our do's and how we don't do our our don'ts actually begins to align more and more with him. It's an incredible thing. Paul writes who did a lot of things he shouldn't do and did a bunch of things that would be really questionable. Like he... He opposed Jesus and tried to destroy the work of Christ. He writes to a church at one point in 1 Corinthians, and he says, you know something? I know now this, that Jesus wasn't just right in what he said, but he's become my righteousness. He's changed me, and now I live out of that. What's your righteousness? At the end of the day, when you look at your life, as David does in Psalm 139, that's another one, a fantastic psalm he wrote, where you know, he says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I was knit together in my mother's womb. I know I've messed stuff up, but as far as the east is from the west, that's how far my sin has been removed. And he gets to the end of it. Because all of that first part is true, he goes, now search me, God, and know my heart within. See if there's any wicked, off-the-path living 
and direct me in the path everlasting. So when you look at your life, what are you banking your righteousness on? Your rightness. Is it this list of do's and don'ts and behaviors? Get out from underneath that. Let Jesus be your righteousness and form you and grow you into someone who routinely thinks like him. And then the behavior follows that. You do the right thing for the wrong reason, you eventually do the wrong thing. You do the right thing, driven by Jesus as your righteousness. You end up doing the right thing. Jesus, for this idea of righteousness that you have brought to us. It was your plan all along, and there are glimpses of it that we see. We see it in in David and what he writes and how he discovers his righteousness in you, these circuitous paths. Jesus, if we find ourselves today in a place of wondering, am I on the path, am I on the path? We may, in fact, be off the path but thank you that you're a restoring God. You restore our souls and you lead us in these circuitous paths of righteousness. Thank you for doing that. Amen. I want to introduce you this morning to someone who has a little bit of experience with this and uh, he's going to tell you a little bit of his story uh, on video. Capture what he says about paths of righteousness in his own life. This is Bob. kids on the weekends, mom and dad would uh, take us into the, the dining room and set us around the table, myself and two brothers, and, and we'd play Monopoly. Coming up through the Depression, my parents would never borrow money. If you didn't have the money, you didn't buy it. So my brothers would actually hoard cash, and when they were doing that, for whatever reason, I was motivated to just go ahead and buy each property on the board. and and eventually Monopoly. As much as I liked cars, I uh, thought, well, maybe I should look about getting to work at a dealership. I had my own, a, a few cars myself and uh, did a pretty good job of turning what was uh, uh, you know, so-so dealership into a rather profitable one. And uh, there, that was when Ford came to me and asked me if I would like to have my own dealership and I, at the age of 32, I said, yeah, I mean, I love cars, why not? Uh, but I didn't have any money to speak of, uh, very little as far as a, a dealership goes. Uh, it was, at then uh, I realized or found out that it was a failing business. It was undercapitalized and uh, I did not realize, even though I wanted to be a car dealer, what that would entail and what I was getting into. Worked a few years digging myself out of a hole and uh, eventually getting, getting things relatively flat. And uh, the, the, the real problem I had then was I actually enjoyed it and had spent more time doing that than I did uh, with my family, which ultimately would end up uh, in a separation and a divorce. And uh, that was quite a trying time for me to go through getting up uh, an underperforming store and trying to hold on to a marriage and I burned out and cannot forget the day it happened but it was April 16th 1989 that God not only put me on my knees put me on my face and uh, shortly thereafter I found myself in front of my desk telling God I've had enough it's yours at that point um, I went to work for him and found solace in his word uh, in particular uh, Malachi 319 Uh, since I was working for him as he said put me to the test I did and he poured out more blessings than I ever thought I would have room for. 
I thought maybe, maybe now wouldn't be so bad a time to go back to that dining room table when we were sitting there and uh, purchasing some, some, some of the properties on the board. And I thought, well, uh, now I'm working for you and things are heading in the right direction. Maybe we ought to expand our vision. And in spite of, of doing well and playing Monopoly again, I felt a void or sensed a void. I wanted to be on the right path. And the frustration or disappointment that one might experience thinking they're on the right path because they've been granted treasure uh, does not necessarily uh, fold out that way. Now, when I think about the, uh, the path of righteousness, I think about a path that's not about me, but what I can contribute to or even uh, leave behind when that time comes. Having experienced treasure and now looking for time and talent, I can find, or I at least believe that the best opportunities we have now are not for us, but for following generations. That's, that's the path to righteousness that I see.